everyone, and welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Man, the Senate has been a mess this week. My heart is breaking. All the bills, all the, you know, anti-freedom bills that are coming out. Uh, you see, I got my man JD behind me. Y'all make sure y'all support JD Ford. He is our lone LGBTQ plus voice in our state house, and we need to make sure we send him back because between him and the other nine, ten senators we have in a 50-person body, they do everything they can to fight for us and regular everyday people. But with them being in a super minority, we know a lot of the legislation that is harmful to trans kids, LGBTQ plus youth, African-American students, just name a marginalized group. They're going to pass that legislation because, you know, sensitive white folk, you know, I'm just going to say that. Uh, but tonight, I am not going to do a rant. No, 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 no. This whole hour is going to be chopping it up, chucking it up with two of the coolest people in the state. First up, my guy. I met him when he ran for Congress in District 9 a few years back. I was so grateful I did not have to vote in that primary because they were two top-notch candidates. He, I tell you what, he showed up, showed out, and we have been connected ever since. Y'all give it up for my man, Dan Cannon. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It has been far too long. I haven't done. I have not. I have not done the show since that campaign. I know, but it you know seems what? Seems like four hundred years ago. Don't say that. Don't. Well, I'm aging well then. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and I gotta say, one thing that that you did after that primary that a lot of people aren't aware of, which I wish uh, some of our other folks would kind of get on board with that. You were quick to support the, the primary winner. You did some fundraising together. You did some days of action together. I thought that was classy, class act. And you know, I, t I always will tip my hat to that. I know you wanted to win, but you showed up and showed out for the winner. And I, I applaud you for that. You will always be one of my favorite people. Well, thank you. And the feeling is mutual. I wish it would have helped us win the general. I know, but right? Here we are. All right, here we are. And I figure like this, if, Mika and Joe can be on Morning Joe every morning, yucking it up. Then me and Nicole can do a show together every now and then. The privilege of owning your own show. Y'all give it up for the Honorable Nicole Bolden, Bloomington City Clerk, and a whole bunch of other titles. Nicole, welcome back to the show, boo. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. I'm so excited to talk to you and Dan about his upcoming book and everything else. So this is great. And we can talk a little bit about the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus also, if you want to hear about it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But first up, um, Dan, yo, you're published. You got a whole book, my way. man. It well, tell us, way, yeah. tell us about Pleading Out. What is this book about? Well, it's about plea bargaining in America. And so the question naturally arises of why would I read an entire book about plea bargaining in America? And really what the, the, the book is, first of all, it's very entertaining, very entertaining, just uh, fantastic. You can trust me because I'm a guy that normally wears elbow patches. I don't have them tonight, but you can tell <laughs> that if somebody wears elbow patches on a regular basis, they are worthy of your trust. And I'm telling you, it's very entertaining. But, but the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's a primer on everything that's wrong with the criminal justice system. And that sounds like a whole lot to tackle in one book, and it is, but um, I do it by looking at everything through the lens of plea bargaining, which is sort of this common thread that runs through everything. So policing and prosecution and the judges that we have on the bench and their sort of permissiveness to let prosecutors do whatever they want. And, um, you know, mass incarceration and the whole ball of wax um, and plea bargaining runs through all of that. And it's one of those things that, you know, you look at you look at the American criminal justice system. And I think most of us recognize that it's in a terrible state of disarray. It's a hideous mess. Um, and you look at the systems in the rest of the world and you say, well, most of those are not quite the mess that we have here. Nobody's incarcerating as many people as we are. Uh, and most, you know, developed countries don't treat their, their 
um, people that have been convicted of crimes nearly as badly right. as we do. And so, you know, what, you, you can also see that the way that we approach plea bargaining here is dramatically different than the rest of the world. Um, so, for instance, you know, 97% of our criminal cases resolve via plea bargaining. Um, somewhere in the 90s. And that number is actually going up all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody else does that. Nobody else in the whole world does that. So the book breaks down why that is and, you know, what happens if we start to pull on that thread a little bit um, and, and cut back the amount of plea bargaining we, that we are actually allowing. And, and I think that, you know, uh, it ultimately comes to the conclusion that even just a little bit of a reduction in the amount of plea bargaining that we're doing it can make a big difference. And, and people, like ordinary people, can actually effectuate those differences and not have to depend on, uh, for example, a horrible state legislature to do something that's in um, the best interests of people. I love so it. That's and what the book. And I love it. I'm so glad that you uh, are, are out here making it happen. So tell me, tell us what what happened. What kind of light bulb moment did you have that you said, I got to write this book. I need to educate people. Well, um, it came from a lot of batting around a lot of different ideas with a literary agent and trying to figure out, you know, what's a good niche and what's going to happen. So I was fortunate enough to, um, I published a thing about the nightmare um, of immigration courts uh, years ago, um, a couple of years ago now, five years ago maybe, um, in Slate. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I was fortunate enough to be contacted by this literary agent in uh, New York, who's, you know, the real deal and, you know, sort of sucked me into this whole world of stuff that I didn't know anything about. Like, you know, I'm just sort of this casual Twitter user that writes blog posts sometimes, you know, and she's like, well, have you thought about writing a book? Um, and I was like, well, I don't know what to write about. So we, we bounced around ideas for a while and eventually, you know, came up with this. Um, and, and as the more I dug into the the subject material, the more I became convinced that the widespread use of plea bargaining is um, essentially a, a tactic, one of many tactics used to perpetuate class divisions in the United States. And that starts to sound a little bit more interesting than just let's look at plea bargaining and right. you know, people that are taking plea bargains. Uh, you know, when you start, to, when you bring the issue of class into it, um, and the idea that courts can be used to foster and perpetuate class divisions. I think it is something that, you know, particularly a lot of um, upper middle class white readers especially have never thought about. Uh, you know, even people with law degrees have never thought about what whole, you know, holy cow, the whole system is set up for, you know, to perpetuate divisions, to make people fail. Um, and that's hard to accept, uh, you know, it, it, but I think that uh, that's what I'm trying to sort of establish in the book, and that, that, that plea bargaining, a widespread use of plea bargaining is one of many tactics that um, is used by the ruling classes to sow class division among the lower classes. So, so is this your first book? So, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to ask. So you approach it from the idea of plea bargaining. Did you get a chance to really dig into the prosecutorial role, or did you just do a broad overview of everything? Because you have mostly done defense work, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I've never been a, a prosecutor, and most of my practice has been on the civil side, but I, I've done a lot of criminal appeals and post-conviction, what we call post-conviction work, so people that are already locked up. Um, and, you know, throughout the course of doing that, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that are incarcerated, um, and we start talking about, like, the sort of basis and genesis of their um, of, of their charges and how they ended up behind bars. And a lot of them um, have taken bad deals that they just thought they had to. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and it's because over the last 200 years, we've developed this culture of um, this is just what you do. You know, and so it's, it's what you do to, to get your case process through the system as as fast as possible mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. not you know it's not a system that is really seeking truth and justice or any of those lofty things that we we you know like Talk to think about, about. Um, but it's really more of a thing of expediency like how many convictions can we can we you know uh can we can we secure in the shortest amount of time 
You know, how many of these cases can we push through? Uh, and we keep getting more and more and more and more. And even as people are aware of the you know, growing criminal justice problems that we've had since the drug wars, really since prohibition, um, you know, our, our, our incarcerated population continues to increase. You know, even in places like, even as the violent crime rate goes down, I think the violent crime rate is down something like 40% since the 90s. And the prison population has doubled. Hmm. You know, so if you look at a situation like that, you know, like violent crime is down 40%, but the prison population has doubled. Why is that? And it's because we're streamlining this process all the time, making it easier and easier and easier for prosecutors to secure convictions. Um, and so that's, and, and so if they, if they've been told by the courts, if prosecutors have been told by the courts that they can use whatever means they whatever means necessary to secure a conviction anything they can think of mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, they're mm -hmm. gonna do it yeah you know yeah. so so this this legislative session there's you know obviously a plethora of bills that are going through both chambers that i find offensive on multiple levels but there's one bill that that came out of this the the senate um sb8 um and sb8 i mean it is specific um SB8 would limit the bail project. I mean, it's like a specific organization and other nonprofits that help uh, bail poor people out of jail. Um, the bill would ban the group from receiving taxpayer money like the $100,000 it received from the Central Indiana Community Foundation. It would also require the state certification or limit the not-for-profit to only help two people every 180 days. The bill also cl says clearly uh, bail organizations can only help people facing a misdemeanor. It caps bail payments to $2,000. A 2021 quarterly report shows the group average averages $2,130 per client, and the median amount it pays is, is, is $1,500. Now, the, the bail project said, we only ask for fairness. If we're going to be called out and we're going to be asked about our decisions in cases, wh why isn't the bail bondsman. And, the, and this struck me because we never go after the gun shop owner when somebody uses a weapon from their store and it's, it's using a, a shooting. But now we're saying, hey, you guys are helping people get out of jail, people who are financially distressed in most cases. And we're saying, no, you, you can only help two people. That's it, that's all. How does a bill like this play into your work and, 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 and the stuff that you discovered while you were creating the pleading out? Well, it's just wantonly cruel. You know, what possible rationale could there be for a bill like that? I, you know, I, have, I have yet to hear, um, I, I, you know, I have yet to hear any good reason for anything like that. And there's a couple of these floating through various state legislatures too. I think there's one that's floating around in Kentucky too. You know, um, and even as more and more Republicans, and this is the thing that, that I found throughout the course of researching this book, like I interviewed all kinds of people that understand that the criminal justice system is a disaster. I talked to a guy that is a, you know, he's a former AUSA, a former assistant United States attorney, uh, and he is a red hat wearing MAGA dude. I mean, like, you know, he and he understands that this thing is a busted piece of crap that we've got. And, you know, I think for the most part, even like even the Koch brothers have been, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, understand that the criminal justice system is a disaster and we don't need to lock more people up. And that's useless and cruel and stupid. And so, you know, you have to wonder what the motivation is. Because the public doesn't want that, right? You know, uh, it, 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 the public doesn't want the bail project to stop. And I, who wants that? Who wants? You know, it? <laughs> it was really interesting because I hadn't heard about this particular bill. I'd been paying more attention to a couple other bills, and so when I looked at Senate Bill Eight, and I saw that it was sponsored by rep by my own representative. So your own senator, can, yeah. It's in Senate bill, but the House rep oh, who's sponsoring it, got it is Peggy Mayfield. And it, it, it's, it's dismaying because this is not something that I want as a constituent. 
And so again, it's that process of saying, this is not what I want. This is not the work that I want you to do. And recognizing that even when I write to her or when I bump into her and tell her that directly, she will likely dismiss my concerns as a voter. It no longer matters. They don't care. They no. don't care. No. You know, and it, I, actually, I talked to J.D. Ford. J.D. Ford, I, I interviewed him extensively for this book, believe it or not. He's like, he's quoted. Uh, I've got a big section from him because I talked to him about the critical infrastructure bill that went through the state legislature in Indiana um, a couple of years ago. And everybody voted for that. Everybody, all the Democrats voted for it. I'm like, why? Mm. Like, why did you guys vote for this? It is a raw giveaway to the oil and gas industry. So I guess maybe that's your, your answer right there. Um, but, you know, anybody who, who, who is reading the bill, you know, this, this, is a, this is a bill that slaps a $100,000 fine on somebody for enabling trespassing. And the last I checked, <laughs> trespassing was already illegal. You know, there's already laws that prohibit trespassing. They passed one in Oklahoma. This is this ALEC creation, this mm -hmm. Frankenstein's monster. They passed one in Oklahoma that sets up a million-dollar fine for somebody who enables trespassing onto critical infrastructure, which is oil and gas industry property. You know, it's like if you're gonna if you're gonna protest a pipeline coming through Indiana, I guess, then you can be fined a hundred thousand dollars for trespassing. And I'm like JD. You know, how did this get through? What happened here? And he's like, they just ram and jam this stuff through. And it's like, it's got a good sounding title. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've got these 5,000 bills flying at our faces. And, you know, somebody comes and speaks for five minutes about the bill. And it's like, oh, protecting critical infrastructure. Well, that sounds pretty good. Let's get that going. You know, and, and so SB8 will pass. Oh, God, and I think yeah. there's very little doubt that, that it's going to pass. And maybe there will be Democratic opposition and maybe not. But as we know, it, it probably doesn't really matter a whole heck of a lot. But you have to wonder why there is no popular support for that. There's Absolutely. no popular support for it. And then you've got something like medical marijuana that, that polls at like 80 or 90 percent. Can't get it. No. All 13 bills from marijuana. All 13 bills are dead that, that were uh, aimed at decriminalizing marijuana at different levels. All of them. Nicole, I want to switch real quick because, you know, we know that in um, the, the black and brown communities, criminal justice reform and criminal, the conversations around criminal justice uh, permeate our communities because we are often disproportionately impacted negatively by a lot of the legislation, a lot of the criminal justice. We, we know this. I posted a video today of the Purdue cop beating up a student. I mean, it was just bad. And one of your roles w w that you have in the state, because you got a, a zillion of them, one of your roles is is the new president of the Monroe County Black Caucus. And right. talk about what your what t what is the Monroe County Black Caucus? And I assume that a part of it is wanting to get more people involved, pe black people involved with the political uh, the policy making process. But talk about your role and and what you guys hope to do in 2022. Okay, well, you just summed up the mission statement of the Black Democratic Caucus in like a tiny little sentence, so congratulations and well done. <laughs> um, you know, we first formed the Black Caucus back in 2016, and that was really a result of sitting down with my mother, who is a judge. Judge. Yep. And uh, kind of laughing about how we were the only two black elected officials in Monroe County. And I said, hey, this is our black caucus, you know. <laughs> um, but it, it struck me that with the number of elected officials in Monroe County, it should be more than two. We could at well, least hit our proportion in population and go farther or further. Doesn't matter. The point is, um, we formed the Black Caucus and started getting people so that we could get more black people involved in the political process. Not everybody wants to run for office. I recognize that. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be in the rooms and actually have those discussions with your policymakers and elected officials. So that was the goal of the Black Caucus. Now, I just got um, elected in the last few weeks. So I am working with the amazing steering committee, which includes the immediate past president, William Hosea, uh, the vice president, who's the other black clerk in Monroe County. She's the county clerk, and 
people around. So, I mean, we have a really great team and we're looking at our goals for 2022, but part of it is we have candidates who are coming up in the primaries and there are several black candidates. I would like to see some of them get elected to their offices that they're running for. I say some and not all because some of them are running against each other. Right. Um, and apparently you can't elect both people. That's the way it works. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work. No. There's no tie. No. Yeah, there's no tie in elections, which is unfortunate because we could have some real fun, I think. But um, so that's what we're looking for. We want to get black folks on the ballot, in office, and serving the community because I think we do better when we have greater representation in office. And that's, I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me, but sometimes people struggle with the notion. So uh, that's what we're doing. And I'm, I'm really excited. And I find that I, I find what that work because I know that we both also sit on um, Stonewall, which is our LGBTQ plus caucus. You know, I'm on IDAC, which is the African American caucus <clears throat> of the statewide IDAC. But one of the things that we're seeing now, like the other side, they want they have like their inaugural DEI class, and you know, blah blah blah. They 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 talk a good game, but they don't have any black people elected to office. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm wondering, or if they do, I, they, they, well, let me say, any black people in the state house. Let me let me clarify, because they don't have any black people in the state house. Uh, and and I'm wondering if we can get more people elected. Can we find a better way to combat pieces of legislation like SB8? Would Monroe, the you know MCBDC, be? <laughs> It's a mouthful. I know, right? <laughs> would, would they also champion um, for legislation or against legislation? Um, is that something that you guys plan on thinking thinking about doing in the future? That is one of my goals. I, you know, I don't want to commit the caucus to doing something that everybody else is not prepared to do. But I think that's important to actually, you know, gather voices together and speak out about things that are going to negatively impact our community. Absolutely, that's, I love it. Yeah. So, okay. So check this out. You know, 1134, HB 1134, which is the I'm scared of brown, brown and black people stories in history class. That is actually um, in out of the House and into the Senate. And, you know, it is Black History Month. And I know in Alabama, they had parents calling and complaining that Black History Month and the programs around Black History Month were CRT. I know a lot of people keep talking about, well, that's Alabama, that's not gonna happen here. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. I do believe this is going to happen. So in the same month that they are saying, we don't wanna talk about things that make the white kids uncomfortable, because they never really ask black parents what, how they feel, or Asian parents, or Hispanic parents, Latino parents. We're in the midst of Black History Month. How do we, and then, for you, Dan, th there are criminal charges associated with these bills for these teachers, and they're, they could lose their license. How are y'all feeling? Uh, and let's just chop it up, right? How are y'all feeling about HB 1134? I, Dan, you go first, because if I start going, go. Dan is going to cut us off for the show. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know. Let's just all let's just all talk at the same time. Oh. See if we can, like a dueling banjos kind of thing here. I, I you know, I, I wrote a piece about this um, for our little regional magazine down here a couple of weeks ago, and I think what's more interesting to me than talking about you know whether or not we're going to, and obviously it's interesting to talk about whether or not we're going to pass this thing. Although I think it's a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 you know, the legislature is going to do whatever it wants. They don't really care what public opinion is. They don't care what the teachers think. They don't care what, you know, certainly don't care what the other side thinks, you know? And I think it's interesting though, to think about where does this stop and who stops them? Right. Where does it stop? Um, and so next year, you know, what are we doing next year in the General Assembly? What happens then? Do we outlaw the teaching of slavery entirely? I mean, you know, what is, I, I mean, really, what's not on the table? Exactly, point, exactly. Right? And the, Where does it stop? Because the courts are not going to stop them. And we've seen that very distinctly and very obviously, right? 
you know, it doesn't matter how many appointees Joe Biden rams through in the next, you know, six months or whatever. This this is not going like, to this is not going to be stopped by the courts. So who stops it? Right. Who, who stops it? That's a good I think question. that's a great question. Oh, I think that's a great question. And and it how do you keep from despairing when you're looking at situations like that? Like when you start looking at the way that our 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 lines are drawn for elections and everything else and you cannot elect people who are actually part of your community and we've redrawn it so that everything is weighted in favor of the most conservative and um it's, it's just it, it actually restrict your view of people I, it, yeah help it, me on this one yeah i'm gonna say it saying. actually what it does is it says okay we want these voters in this district and we want these voters in this district and we want hey, we want you to run in this district because we've drawn this district for you to be as successful as you possibly can. And people are always like, well, no, how does that work? Jerry, blah, blah, blah. They're a voting record. They know how yeah. people vote. So they can tell if you voted in the Republican primary or the Democratic primary. So it's not like this is arbitrary because I've heard people say, well, no, it's not gerrymandered. They know because they know where you voted. And, and the idea that we don't want a government that is representative of all people and that we want a narrow view. And this is the thing that gets me about this is that one, we're not preparing our youth for a future. We're not preparing them to be critical thinkers. I'm sorry, did I say critical? I know they don't like that word. Uh, we're not preparing them to be critical thinkers and be able to have, see nuanced opinions um, in, in a nuanced way. But this is actually really harmful to everything about who we are as Indiana. For example, our economy. We know that Intel just decided to put a plant in Ohio versus Indiana because Ohio has a larger number of college graduates than does Indiana. But we're not preparing our students to excel in post-secondary education. We're inhibiting their ability to excel in post-secondary post, um, education. Well, I think it's possible. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think it's possible that that's, a, that's entirely by design. You know, and and, and because I, I, I think that you've got a bunch of people in the state house at this point that are hostile to the whole idea of public education. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I well, know. not just public education to education, period. I mean, it seems to be lately that we are rewarding a lack of intelligence. We mm. are not looking for intelligence and education in our leaders anymore. We are celebrating ignorance and mm. poo-pooing science and history and resources and saying that that's somehow bad or not something that we should desire. Well, so. if, you know, if, if you, you need, uh, and this is a lot of what I talk about in the book, everything goes back to the book. Right? Uh, Good. No, <laughs> you need. Oh, by the a, way, if you want to pre-order a book and you're watching the show, <laughs> click the link and you can pre-order my man's book. All right. Sorry, I had to get that plug you're, in there. If you're in charge in America, you need a pliable, vulnerable, uneducated workforce because those are the folks that are going to eat as much doo-doo as, as, as you want to get. I know, you know, you said we have kids watching. I can't say what I want to say. <laughs> um, but they, they, you know, these are the folks that, that are, are going to, you know, just show up and do the work and get paid as little as possible and not ask any questions. Right, right. So you need you need an uneducated workforce. America is, I mean, the key to understanding America is that we need people to do as much work as possible for as close to free as possible. Oh, say that and again. So if we can oh, help. That sounds help. vaguely familiar, but they <laughs> might talk about that. In critical don't, don't, see, if we don't teach you that that was a thing, then if we do that to you, you won't know what actually happened before. Didn't we have exactly. some books that called them happy workers? Uh, something like that. I mean, because, you know, the, the Africans that were brought over as cargo, you know, it was the, the triangular, you know, trade. It was, you know, they were, well, the, the, somebody said that they were uh, migrant workers. Something Texas, like that, yeah. Texas, <laughs> Texas called them migrant workers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like they could, I mean, yeah. I mean, assume that, assume that you're a white person that's totally disinterested in black history, right? I mean, you know, assume that you just don't care about that. Slavery was a really long time ago. You never, I mean, you're never exposed to the history of labor unions. 
for the same yeah. reason. Like you know, the uh, like the, the the bonus army, the burning of veterans camps, and the stuff that was going on in West Virginia, and I like all this other stuff. I didn't learn about that stuff till I was in my thirties. I don't think I never heard about any of that. Um, and and you know, so so we're not getting any of the history of working class people at all. Um, and it's and it's. I mean, I think that. Best case scenario for this um, general assembly is that all the teachers get super pissed off and walk off the jobs. And then they can say, well, look, look what an abysmal failure public mm -hmm. education is. Mm -hmm. We better just turn everything over to private enterprise. Absolutely. But if you're if you don't make enough money to send your kid to that private school, then your kid is going to be warehoused somewhere else. And that's yeah. the part that people are not thinking about yet you know, over a million students are in public schools, but that's where you want to keep stealing money from. There's another bill out there that that's switching chambers where if the community has said, yo, our public schools don't have enough resources, we're going to put a referendum on the ballot and raise some tax money to give to our public schools. There's a bill out there right now that says they have to share that money with charter schools. It starts at charter schools, but you know it's going to parochial schools that don't let, you know, they don't like gay people. And it's going, it's going to the, the private schools who get to pick and choose which students that come in there. But the idea that as parents are saying, we want to raise money for our people, for our schools, and then there's people coming and say, oh, you get more money, we get more money. No. Well, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing to say after <laughs> that. You, you said that. We're just kind of like, yeah. Pretty much. I mean, it's just, it's off of something. But Dan, I did have a question. You mentioned something I thought was really interesting. And you said, you know, white folks are not necessarily interested. What made you become interested? Well, um. Because you're a straight white dude. Yeah. Let's be from Southern Indiana. Let's just put this out there, right? <laughs> and we, you know, you, you. I was, yeah, I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, um. In, in, I mean, everything that's happened to me is because I was in the right place at the right time. Everything good that's ever happened to me, you know, I just lucked out. And I had uh, friends in high school who were gay and who were black. And I think, you know, the first one of the first experiences I've ever had, and I've written about this. Um, you know, I lived in Los Angeles for a couple of years. Um, I dropped out of high school and went to Los Angeles to be uh, a musician for a couple of years. And I did that for a while. And one of the guys I, I hung out with was, was, was a much, gold, much older black guy. Um, guitar player and you know just taught me a lot about how the world works and I didn't believe it right you know I'm 17 18 and I'm and he's you know telling me about the history of what's going on in the country and I'm like you know man I, I don't know it kind of seems like kind of seems like black folks is, are always beating up on white people I don't know like uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it all seems the time. like uh, yeah it seems like the black people are the really violent ones, which is something that I honestly and earnestly believed at 17, you know, um, and it seems ridiculous now. But I, I think that, you know, like, there are plenty of, you know, like sheltered white kids that grow up in white neighborhoods and don't have any contact with anybody else that genuinely believe that and also believe that they're not racist. And, you know, they just they're going to they're going to they're going to eat what they're fed. Right. And I was that kid. And um, we got stopped by LAPD hmm. uh, one night. And this is like after he's been telling me and telling me and telling me. I'm like, oh, okay, Phil, whatever. And because uh, I'm 17 and I know everything. Right? Don't you always and, know everything at 17? Yeah. And we get stopped by LAPD um, who was looking for two other guys, like a white guy walking with a black guy, you know, blocks away from us. But, you know, that, that we matched, we fit the bill. So, uh, like five cop cars, and this is the nineties, right? You know, mm -hmm. this is 95, mm -hmm. 94, 95, like right around the time of the, the OJ decision. Right. Um, I was in LA for that. Uh, but they, these guys surround us and put us in handcuffs and they kind of just like politely set me over to the side and like, are you okay? All right, good. And then. They are shaking my man down, you know, for 30 minutes and screaming in his face and, you know, just hassling him. And I mean, I just, you know, I, I mean, I saw it right then and there. 
Um, and you didn't think it was, was just a know, one-off? Because that's that's the other thing we always hear. Well, it's just it's an isolated incident. Yeah, I mean, maybe I did. I don't know. Um, but I was able to sort of connect it with the things that he was telling me about race in America, yeah. and yeah. and you know, plant some seeds that grew from there. And I was lucky enough to, you know, continue to get educated. I think, I mean, I think even still for years after that, I was probably what you would, you know, you would call a horror, well, at least in my mind, a horrible racist because I just didn't know anything mm. about, you know, uh, about black folks in America. Yeah. I mean, I just didn't know um, any of that history that we've been talking about for the entire hour, or any of the stuff that they're trying to keep kids from knowing right now, you know, didn't know any of that. And as I started to read more and started to learn more, and I was fortunate enough to like want to get an education and to, you know, have been raised by a mom that values education and cares about that stuff, you know, um, and, and, you know, so I dug into more of that. And I went to law school and dug into it more and more. And, you know, I just, I was lucky enough to have those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I mm -hmm. think one of the most insidious lies uh, and it touches on all, all the stuff that we've been talking about all night long. One of the most insidious and popular lies that has happened in the last few years, because college is so damned expensive, right? is this idea that, well, listen, college is not for everybody, which, okay, fine. You know, you don't want to go, don't go. But everybody's got a stake in an educated society. Right. Like I get that somebody can go and and and, you know, learn to be a carpenter or a plumber or something like that. But I want when the plumber shows up to my house, I want to be able to talk about politics and philosophy and all that yes. stuff. Like everybody's got a stake in an educated society. And so this and you hear it from Democrats, you hear it from the left all the time. Well, you know, college is not for everybody, but education is for everybody. Absolutely. And, uh, now, now, I will say so one important. thing that that oh. they do on the left. Hold on. One thing they do do on the left, because I'm on there, is that we do talk about the trade schools, and that is education. I believe the trade schools are it is education, and it, it instill because bottom line is, I I'm not an electrician. I'm just not, and I'm not yeah. gonna go <laughs> messing around, messing around, become a crispy critter, cause I done done something wrong. So I, I no need one or a plumber no or one disagrees a black, with that. not a plumber. Listen, don't be over here telling our business. My goodness. <laughs> this is not what this show's about. I don't just, what the heck's going on with you? You know, I was going to um, touch on something that Dan said, because Dan, you wrote an open letter to President Biden um, that was on, I don't remember which, uh, ven which Bring your mic website it was, but you had a, can you remind me what it, that was? Oh, uh, well, let's see. That's up on, on the Medium page and also got published by the Leo down here, which is the... Yeah. yeah. And so I read that letter and there was definitely, there was, it was humorous. I, I understood, you know, please reduce student debt because people can buy my book. But yeah. running through it also, I think, and I've seen it from other people recently, is the idea of we're paying a ton for education and you need people to be educated. So I, I appreciated it. I appreciated the humor. I sent it to a whole bunch of people and I, I struggle with this, that people are mortgaging themselves before mm -hmm. they're even 22 years old. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some people who are talking about graduating from undergraduate or from graduate school. If they are so lucky, with hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe not, let's say tens of thousands of dollars. Either way, starting off in the hole is starting off in the hole. And they're locked in. And then people are like, well, you shouldn't have borrowed so much money. Well, we're also telling our students and our kids as a society, this is what you need to be successful. Well, so I, and, and, and to top that off, Nick, you, you know, we're talking about generational wealth. People who have generational wealth don't need to get student loans. And so, you you know, no. we, we tell everybody, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but I got to go get me a boot with some straps, right? So, I mean. You're going to pay. You're going to pay one way or the other. Right. For, for law yeah. students that are coming out, and I know you know this, Nicole. I mean, for law students that come out now, if you graduate with $100,000 worth of debt, are you going to go be a public defender? Are you going to go and, you know, work at the Legal Aid Society? If so, you're going to eat a lot of ramen and you're yep. never going to pay off your $100,000 debt. 
and you know, um, a, and that's a lot cause more health attractive. Problems that you can't afford to, to pay. <laughs> yeah, a lot more of an attractive prospect might be to go and work at a defense firm that pays you a hundred thousand dollars a year or more to defend Walmart in employment actions or to defend the oil and gas industry or to do, you know, like, so you're going to pay. Yeah. You're going to pay. Which brings it back to not having enough people who are actually representing the poor people in court and they need more lawyers. And hence they end up for public defenders. They need more prosecutors. And then they end up plea bargaining. Pleading out. work for this? They end up pleading out and they streamline they the system. Out. Come on. Did I tell you I got to <laughs> click on the link and pre-order his book? Did I say that? Click on the link, pre-order my man's book. But this is, I mean, no, it's, it's... I pre-ordered it already. Yeah. I'm I'm crazy excited, but I'm impatient because, you know, I, yes, I like to I'm read it. Driving it. I, I am it. driving it to your house. I am going to drive it to your house. <laughs> Thank you. To... you. You know, it's up in Bloomington. It's not that far. You can bring some Girl Scout cookies, too. I, oh, I will oh, totally do that. Let me know when I you bring in the Girl Scout cookies because I... I ain't going to be there when you bring the Girl Scout cookies. I'm going to be somewhere where there's a treadmill because, honey, me and COVID still over here fighting. <laughs> but this, I mean, there's so much uh, that, that we see that um, impacts our society. A lot of it is based on policies that are being presented at every level of government. And we see that there's an apathy. Um, you know, we get burnt out. Like, I'm, even on MSNBC, I, I get tired of hearing the same two stories every day. January 6th. And how stupid Donald Trump was. Janu January 6th, or, you know, I get tired. So I want to hear some nuanced stuff. Tell me about what's happening in Florida where they're passing crap bills. And, and even then, when we start hearing about these things, now we can start galvanizing people. Because everybody has a different, you know, passion, a political, you know, thing that gets them going. But if you don't hear about them, they, then You've you don't You've got to do bottom up. I mean, it's got to be bottom up. That's the whole, and, 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 and again, it's such a great book. I cover this yeah. extensively. <laughs> Is it a great book? You just say so yourself. No. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I, I trust you, you're thinking, you're thinking it's such a boring topic, plea bargaining, 300 pages on plea bargaining. Never, Cannon. No, really, seriously. No, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the most rewarding things I got to do was, was to um, interview criminal justice organizers, and that's the whole last chapter of the book. And the reason for doing that is because, you know, like there, there have been law professors screaming about plea bargaining and every other policy issue under the sun for, you know, as long as there have been law professors. This has been a, an issue like critical race theory, like anything else that's been out there for, you know, a really long time. And no one cares. Right. You know, um, and it's like because the prescriptions for changing something like this are always like, well, if we could only get in and pass some laws to change the entire structure of the American law system, then we'd be fine. And that's not going to happen. I mean, you know, it's like you can write all the bills you want, mm -hmm. and, and if they never get passed, it doesn't matter. So the top-down change is not going to – I mean, we've got to stop looking at that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and start looking more at, like, how do we organize a mass of people to, to do something that actually makes change? So I got a con uh, Miguel Hampton is as as watching the show, and you know I love how much I love MH. I think we all like Gully. Uh, he says if our jail system wasn't an economic system, we we wouldn't need uh, as many um, defenders, and and you know if it wasn't if we weren't using it as a feeder system for private private you know prisons, then we probably yeah. wouldn't need so many. But everybody de deserves a fair, affordable defense, no matter you know what the case is. We watching you, Gully. We see you. <laughs> but I, I, the the other thing you touched on, everybody, you know, being bottom up. I had a, co a conversation um, at my job the other day where, you know, it's Black History Month, so they want to pull out, you know, MLK quotes. And, and honestly, I, it's cool. It was a quote I hadn't heard about all of us coming together and everybody, you know, being together. But see, I even though it was one of his quotes, I, I don't necessarily agree with it totally because... When you get everybody, in my opinion, when you get everybody in the same boat, everybody has their own agenda. So they stick their oar in the water, and we're never going anywhere because everybody's paddling in a different direction. I, I think we ought to go, but when you say your bottom-up approach is, is more like, you know what, I think everybody can be going in the same direction if we get in our own boats. 
And I don't mean that in a negative way. What I mean is if you are, you find whatever it is that you're focused on and you go forth. And if you ain't got a boat, I'm in my boat, but I'm going to help you get yours. And the, and the reason why I say that is because before we had 180,000 channels to watch, before we had the internet, before we had attention spans no more than 256 characters, everything was localized. You didn't really know what was going on in Sacramento in Indianapolis. Hell, you barely knew what was going on in Indianapolis if you were in Bloomington. Mm-hmm. And, and so you were able to like get focused on what your community needed because you didn't have all those other distractions. Times are different. And I think a part of it is because of how technology has changed, how we can communicate. I mean, i.e., I have a weekly show on for free, (laughs) right? I mean, you know, I don't have the same million viewers, but nobody has the same viewer audience because we're all segmented out. But I think if we- Hold on, are we not getting paid for this? Oh, oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, This is a no budget show. (laughs) This is a no budget show. But I mean, I get that we all want to combine and put, combine some of our efforts. But I, th- I think when we combine too many efforts, we get, we get pulled and we get distracted. I know that all of us have worked on projects before and we've all heard of scope creep, right? You start adding stuff to your project, you're going to get scope creep and you're never going to get done with your project. There, there's, but but we all get in our boats and we all go the same direction. But you be doing your thing in your boat. I'm gonna do my thing in my boat, and we just all you know get to the finish line together. What y'all think about that theory? I I thought it was a very extended. I can't hear you. What you say? I said I thought it was pretty extended to get to that point. <laughs> it wasn't like y'all was trying to I, cut like, me off. Like I was I was like okay okay. I get you now. I follow you. But for a minute, I was like, this is, you know, but I I don't think anybody disagrees with that notion. You're going to pick a focus and go with it. Um, And there are times when it overlaps and there are times when they wildly diverge. That's okay. But I I think, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but I think what Dan was saying is we have to have a bottom up approach and all of us be focused on that. Doesn't mean people can't do other things. I think you're both agreeing. You just oh yeah, just saying it different, different ways. ways. And I, I, I'm it. actually highlighting what he's saying, right? I'm actually like okay. he's saying bottom up, and there's a way to be focused in the bottom up, right? Yeah. You can't you can't have a bottom up when everybody is again paddling in different directions. Listen, yeah. I I am a writer, and I love long tortured metaphors. <laughs> uh, Was the it longer <laughs> and more tortured, the better. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I just think that if you look, uh, all I'm saying is you look across the board, you look at state legislatures, you look at Congress, you look at the courts, especially, you know, because that's just sort of where I'm, I'm focused. That's my wheelhouse. They're not going to help us. You know, where's, where is, where is salvation in any of those things? And we've been taught, especially lawyers have been taught like, you know, that's, that's how you get change made. As you go from the top down, you get on the inside of the institution and you do these great things. Um, and I just think we're at a moment now historically where we need to realize that that's not it going doesn't to work. work. That way. But none of our great no. societal changes ever came from the top down. None of that's them. Right. Yeah, know, that's right. You know, if you don't ever study what the suffrage movement was about and they, those women going to Seneca Falls, that wasn't a top down. That was definitely a bottom up. Now, granted, some of those women were highly influential and they didn't really care about brown and black women but they were singularly focused they were focused on look let me just get women to vote and y'all worry about y'all later and whether or not we like the approach or not some of us don't like it but they were focused and because they were focused on what it was that they were trying to do now other people can come behind them and say okay well white women got to vote black women want to vote too black men want to vote can we not kill people when they try to go to the poll? So there's like a, you know, you, you get one thing and you build on it, you build on it. I don't know. That's just, I, I just, I think people spend too much time focusing at the top as well because it's noisy and shiny and pretty and orangey or whatever. Easy. It, th- reading Easy. a bill is hard for people. Reading yeah. the Senate, we talked about several bills and, and you guys both talked about when you read that bill. People don't, too, it's longer than 256 characters. They're not going to do that. The legislators don't read it. The no. legislators don't read it. 
you know, that was the whole point of the passage with J.D. Ford is that they're just ramming this stuff through. I talked to Attica Scott, who's I love the Attica. only, you know, Attica, oh, she, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, I, her I talked to her about the same thing, same thing in Kentucky, right? You know, there's a few people reading this stuff, but it's mostly just, all right, well, is this another, you know, like Alec giveaway, uh, whatever, we're just going to I have a new, a new terminology for that acronym, ass licking executive committee. I'm sorry, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh my God, what will the children who are watching this program say? They'll think it's a donkey joke. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. That's right. <laughs> Jesus, That's right. Alex. I'm just they saying, love, but they, you're right. They, they love Trek, right? And the thing that they, they yeah. weigh into donkeys. Or no, there's donkeys in, in Encanto. So my kids love the the, the, the donkeys in Encanto. Oh. Yeah. There's like oh, un, yeah, the there's unicorn donkeys. Okay, yeah, the movie. Yeah. I didn't. I yeah. had to think about it for a minute, and then apparently that's a hot movie. I I haven't seen it yet, but I will. It is very hot in my house. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> they uh, they love, love Encanto. I love it. Yeah. So as we you know uh, are getting down to the last few minutes of the show, you know, um, I wanted to ask, you know, we've kind of touched on a few issues, education and 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 the criminal justice system. Talk about what is actually like got y'all fired up like over the last six months or whatever it is. Whatever it is. Let's just, I mean, you know, Nicole, you and I have like heated conversations about a whole bunch of stuff all the time. What's mm -hmm. what's got you fired up? Right now I'm really focused on the twenty twenty two elections and what's gonna happen next because we have we need to get more Democrats elected to office. That's all there is to it. And I don't think that I know we have a big tent and not everybody thinks the same way, but I am I'm genuinely scared at the imbalance in our state. Um, and I, I would like to see more people who are actually doing good work so that we're not talking about 1134 turned upside down as hell. I mean, I, it's just not OK. So that's what I'm looking at. And I recognize that it's it's going to be a lift, but. That, that's what I want to see. More I love Democrats. It. What you got, Dan? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I think I'm I'm experiencing a little bit of outrage fatigue, like everybody else right now. What? Um, I am I am really encouraged by. I will say this first. I'm really encouraged by my law students. Mm. I get to interact with them, you know, every day and they are smart and they're focused and they understand the world way better than my generation did when we graduated from law school. So, you know, and they're all on board with, you know, ideas that, you know, maybe we, you know, like half of my class thought was crazy at the time. It was just like this, this sort of accepted thing that, you know, all of all the institutions in America are, are founded on white supremacy, for example, you know, <laughs> like, um, that kind of thing is like, they get it. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm, encur I'm encouraged by that. Um, I think I've been stuck sort of in, uh, thinking about disaster relief, mm -hmm. uh, after the tornadoes blew through Western Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, and Illinois. And so I've known a lot of students and a lot of people that have uh, been affected by that. And, you know, thinking about all the implications of, you know, um, what what disaster relief really looks like, um, whose pockets are getting aligned as a result of that kind of disaster, mm. as a result of COVID-19, as a result of, you know, and stuff that looks good on the outside but isn't really good, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. that is sort of dressed up like a good thing. Um, and that's that's sort of what I've been interested in. I'm trying to figure out what I'm what I'm going to write the next book about. <laughs> I love it. I'm glad that you're thinking about writing another book. That's yeah. dope. Nick, when your book coming out? Oh, never. I am not a writer. I am a reader. So that is why I sit there and I'm very, very lucky to know several wonderful authors. And I just like to read the things that they produce because they are amazing. So, and I count Dan in that group. So. I will Thank you. read How it. How do you have time to read with everything that you do? <laughs> you are asking you see the wrong, face? You are asking um, the wrong question. Real real talk, real talk. We're on vacation. And we're <laughs> hanging out at the beach. And we've been together 24 hours. So we hanging out the whole time. And we're laying out on the beach and sunbathing and all of this stuff. After the at the end of the vacation, she says, Well, I finished four books. When did you have time? 
to finish four <laughs> books. We were together the whole time. Yeah. I got, I think I got one paragraph in of the book that I took to the beach with me. I, man, yeah, she's got, I don't know, she reads them in her sleep, I guess, I don't know. It really is incredible, especially considering, Nicole, how high maintenance everything seems in your life, if you know what I mean. I, I do. I do. I love my job. It's great. And I like working with the state party and with the Black Caucus and the Good Trouble Network and some sure. of the other groups Stonewall. that I've Don't of. you forget Stonewall. It's Stonewall. You know, they have a new uh, secretary. I stepped down as secretary uh, this week, but I am still Keep very active councilman. on the board. So, but I, I do love to read. So that's one of those things that I make time for Oh my God. when I can. So it is very much a part of what I need and do. Also, I read before I go to sleep, so that's... See, reading sometimes puts me to sleep, so, you know... Oh. You know. No, no, no. And reading. I, I, I try. I am a, I am a, I'm a documentary person, so I'm an auditory learner. I recognize that. You know, I used to, thanks to you and the whole entire family, y'all y'all don't make me feel bad because I don't read book after book after book, but I'm an auditory learner, so I don't read as many books, but I get this... I give them to Nicole well, now and... But you also read a lot of bills. So if I want to know something about a bill that's coming out of the House or the Senate, I'm going to call you and say, have you read any of the bills that I should pay attention to? So yeah, it all works I, out. I like articles. I do like articles. I like fact-based, give me the, the quick and dirty. Um, and then if I need to research something on top of that to understand what it means, I'll do that. Um, and so my reading usually is a building kind of thing versus giving me a 300-page book and saying, here, how about it? You know, yeah, um, but I'm pretty sure this one is going to be excellent because Dan is a Dan. very engaging writer. Like he wrote about, uh, no, it wasn't post-traumatic stress syndrome. It was secondary stress some, some yeah, secondary, secondary trauma yeah, syndrome. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, secondary, secondary uh, traumatic stress. That's I guess it. there's no disorder. Yeah, in the P, in the PT, uh, sorry, the uh, whatever you call it, the DSM. Ordering out the DSM. Yeah, there's no D, there's no D there. So. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. But it was, um, and you would think, like, reading about trauma and how people stress out, particularly as lawyers, when they're looking at crime scene photos and along mm -hmm. over time, you would think that that would be something that would be depressing or you just want to put it away in terms of reading. But I was absolutely glued to the page, well, screen in that particular case. But it was fascinating and it resonated. I related to some of it. And... Um, so he's a very, very good writer. And some of the things that you would think would be dry are not. So I I'm really it. looking forward to the book because I that's going it. to be something well, different. You're very kind. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to get me a copy because, you know, and I want it signed by you. I want to sign, I want I a DC on somewhere. I thought we agreed that my daughters were going to sign it because I think that's what's actually going to increase it in value. Um, so you going to tell know. me what I want? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I would not. I would not dare. I, listen, I, 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 I baited thing. you. <laughs> I suckered you. <laughs> it's, it's your show, after all. I, I, I suckered you, my man. All no, right, Dan no, Cannon. No, you can do no wrong on this show. Oh, no. Oh. I just suckered you. I, what? Yes, yes. I forgot to mention one thing because I was talking about Stonewall. Mm -hmm. And coming up on February 19th, is Stonewall's first annual Love is Love fundraiser. And so it's going to be great. We've got some incredible speakers. We've got Malcolm Kenyatta. We've got Rosemary Ketchum. It is going to be great. So people should come and join us and support Stonewall. I love it. That's my little it. plug. Sorry. I love it. That's great. And, you know, speaking of Stonewall, uh, we sent a letter or a, a, a a public records request over to um, the state house uh, because they are supporting uh, HB 1041. Uh, I applaud my caucus for continuing the fight. Uh, you guys don't know what 1041 is, and it bans trans girls from participating in sports. Um, and it's specific to just trans girls. There's nothing about trans boys. There's you know, and and the organizations that are pushing this. So I applaud. Um, Senator Ford and all the folk who continue to, to offer equity and equality to uh, marginalized communities. I don't understand how people literally can write legislation that is 
not just harmful in the sense that they think they're, you know, managing fair play, but they're literally codifying in, in legislation that as a trans person, you don't matter. Your, your, who you are as a human just doesn't matter. We're going to, we're going to write it down and put it in law. And they, they heard it in the, in the, in the committee yesterday. It's another one of those bills that's coming out and the trauma that is going to be caused to those trans youth. I sit on the board of Trinity Haven, the only LGBTQ plus centered residents for LGBTQ plus youth who are at risk of being homeless. And we know those youth and, and, and increasingly our trans youth are at, at a greater risk of harm, homelessness. And now we're writing into Indiana statute that they do not matter. Their existence should be dismissed. And, and I, I applaud my caucus. And, and f so this fundraiser is to support ca candidates who would oppose such things and believe that every person, I mean, if you're a tax paying parent, and you are sending your trans kid to school, and they've decided to transition at whatever, because IHSAA already has rules for at what point you've decided to transition. But you're paying taxes, and your kid can't participate. Are you going to get a refund? No, because your money is going to a charter school, <laughs> a parochial <laughs> school, <laughs> in the form of a voucher. So no, you're not getting your money. All right, Indiana's own Dana Black. Dan Cannon, thank you so much for coming on. We'll do this again. Maybe we bring on Gully, because I know he down there having a good time. Right? That would be a dope combo. Um, good luck. Y'all, pre-order his book. I'm so proud of my man. He's doing great, great work. He didn't have. He's another example where you don't have to be an elected official to have an impact on your community, and he is doing just that, raising those beautiful daughters. Nicole Bolden, I'm not saying goodbye, because I'm going to talk to you later anyway. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But thank Thanks, you for coming bro. on the show. I appreciate it. And keep 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 the work up. Um, and don't overload yourself. You won't have time to read those books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All right. It will never happen. I will encourage people to not only pre-order Dan's book, but also if you want to support the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus, I believe Dana has dropped the link for our ACLU account. You can donate. We'll take it. Absolutely. And we'll get more black officials elected in Monroe County. Absolutely. And there's always room for more in the tent. There's, if you're not really sure what you can do to contribute to this policy making process, reach out to anybody you see on this panel because we can tell it's all about what you enjoy and what you like to do and, and finding a way to infuse that into the policy making process. You don't have to have any special skills because the orange menace was the president for four years. And I guarantee your intelligence level is su significantly superior to his. All right, Indiana's own Dana Black. I will holler at y'all next week. Peace. Thank you all so much.